Welcome to the RSP Film and Theory. Joining me as always is FSWA Writer of the Year finalist, Adam Harstad. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. If you haven't read Adam's work, certainly you need to go over to Football Guys right now because some of the articles that he submitted and samples of that work which I think most of you have read if you're following this show. But those of you who haven't, you should go check it out because a lot of the things that we discuss on here is, um, you know, based on a lot of the work that, you know, obviously that he's been doing. Yeah, and um, paywall until um, after the Super Bowl and then the paywall always comes down uh, after the Super Bowl. Uh, but we did pull the paywall down a little bit early on some of the award submissions. Uh, so if you go on my Twitter at Adam Harstad, you can find links to that stuff. Um, and if you haven't been a Football Guys subscriber, obviously I'm a big fan of Football Guys and I subscribed for years. I, I think it's definitely worth, but I get that, you know, other people are in different places. You know, maybe you don't even play fantasy football or something. Um, but if you're curious about checking it out, um, should be available on Twitter. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of the work that you do, even though it certainly has great fantasy football application, even if you're just a football fan, and you're interested in and in looking at certain things that do just Im, impact from a modeling perspective, looking at or a philosophical perspective of how how you know kind of the trajectory of football careers and development and production um, and different outcomes. I think it, it, Adam takes a really fascinating and insightful look at that material on a regular basis. Today, I do hear um, I do hear from time to time that I'm one of the favorite fantasy football writers for people who don't play fantasy football. So see, and I would call that an ultimate compliment. So that's a you know, you know, because nothing wrong with our fantasy audience. They're great, absolutely great. We love the game. We love playing the hobby. It's fantastic. But it's also fun when that bleeds into being a football fan, um, just pure and simple without any kind of um, other incentives involved. Um, today we're going to have fun with just talking about pure football players and you know they were hum Hall of Fame nominations obviously in the re recent months we're going to have the the announcements on February 8th so we thought it'd be fun to look at those Hall of Fame nominees and just talk about who we'd pick for the process you can pick up to five um, and you know the nominees this year you know, we'll just list them in, in order that USA Today reported them. I think they did them alphabetically. Eric Allen, the former uh, Eagles cornerback who played also with the Saints and Raiders, who was all pro in 89 and had six Pro Bowls, 14-year um, career. Jared Allen, he had led the league in sacks twice. He was a sack away from tying the single-season record with 22.5 in 2011 with the Vikings. Um, and he made the uh, official single season record. I the have to official, say, for yes. all the uh, Koi Bacon fans out there. Yes, Koi Bacon for sure. I have lots of his card in my collection. That's for sure. Um, but you know, four Pro Bowls, four All Pro lists. So you know, he's twelfth all time on the official sack list. Um, Willie Anderson, you know, thirteen seasons or twelve seasons with the Bengals um, as their tackle. Three consecutive Pro Bowl bids. Jari Evans, right guard with the Saints, four-time Pro Bowler. Um, and then Dwight Freeney, you know, with the Colts, um, 18th all-time on the official sack list, um, three-time All-Pro. Antonio Gates, 16-year career, um, you know, pretty much the linchpin of the Chargers' offenses for all those years. Um, eight straight Pro Bowls. Rodney Harrison, the probably the guy that um, was largely responsible for probably the NFL taming down um, how they hit people. I mean, I wouldn't say he was largely responsible, but he certainly was the tipping point probably among some other players when it came to uh, being a hard-hitting player. Um, 24, 34 career interceptions to all pro teams. Devin Hester, probably, I, for my money, the greatest return specialist of all time um you know 14 punt returns for touchdowns five return touchdowns for kickoffs um you know fantastic talent tory holt 1300 yard season six straight times andre johnson four straight 100 yard catch seasons and seven straight thousand yard campaigns 
um, and 70 touchdowns. Um, Julius Peppers, you know, first overall pick out of Carolina, you know, 159 and a half career sacks, so he's fourth all time. Probably one of the most talented running backs I've ever seen just on pure talent, Fred Taylor. Um, you know, played 12, you know, played 13 seasons, which is pretty impressive in that respect. Um, and, you know, he had 1,100 yards and, um, you know, in multiple seasons. And, you know, he's known as having the league's highest average rushing yards per game of 107.6 in 2000 and 66 rushing touchdowns. And the list is still pretty strong. We got Reggie Wayne, you know, with, you know, um, you know, averaging 1,200 yards per season between t 2004 and 2012 but with Peyton Manning and Mar Marvin Harrison and Dallas Clark. Patrick Willis, great middle linebacker, eight seasons with the 49ers and... Um, and basically was a five-time All-Pro and led the league in tackles two out of his first three seasons. Darren Woodson, three-time super, three -time super Bowl winner in safety with the Cowboys, three All-Pros. So that's a, there's some certainly some excellent players on the list. But, you know, you mentioned before the show, you, you know, about the number. We, we talked about the number they could select, which were five, um, up to five in terms of like players who are on the modern list but you know you mentioned that you know does it have to be five and it seems like they're trending towards doing five every year rather than what they used to do which was saying no nah, maybe we'll only pick the ones that we really think are truly deserving for you know for this year yeah i mean i have a lot of thoughts on the hall of fame as like an idea and the hall of fame as an institution that actually exists um and and i'm i've been a big fan of the hall of fame i'm a big fan of nfl history as you guys probably know um and i think over the last 10 to 20 years i've sort of become disillusioned with the institution uh, i as i pay more attention i notice more of what i would consider its flaws um, but i recognize a lot of these are aesthetic preferences and other people might view them as strengths rather than flaws uh, and I have a lot of suggestions where, like, if I ran the Hall of Fame, I would do things differently. In fact, some buddies of, of mine uh, who are also big into NFL history, like, created our own fake Hall of Fame and said, if we were actually running the show, how would we do it? Uh, which, of, of course, is easy for us because it's important to remember that the Hall of Fame is not just an idea. It's an actual physical building. Uh, like, you can't just say, I'm just going to elect 100 people because the Hall of Fame has to handle the logistics for putting 100 people into the Hall of Fame in a single year. It can't do that. It's constrained by physical limitations that, uh, you know, somebody just writing on the Internet is not. So, so um, let me ask you this real quick. If you've already done this a little bit with your friends, do you know the amount of players who are in the Hall of Fame versus the amount that you guys actually have in it? So um, we just, life happened and we kind of ran out of time. And so we haven't really kept up with it. And we never got like fully current on it. Um, it's interesting because everybody kind of has their own standards. And colloquially, colloquially, people will be referred to as I'm a big hall guy. I'm a small hall guy. Um, where like some people view the Hall of Fame as a place like just to put like the true elite of the elite. Um, whereas others want to be maximally inclusive. Um, and they want to say, you know, like, this is a place to honor the people who came and, and played and made the game what it is. It's not a bad thing to honor more people. Um, so there's a lot of philosophical debate on that. I tend to be more on big hall end of the spectrum. Um, I would agree I think, with that. I like that yeah. idea. One of my problems with the current institution is it tends to be a big hall for certain positions and a small hall for certain other positions. Yeah. Uh, and that's one thing that I'm not really thrilled with. Um, another problem, I think, is that it hasn't really kept pace with expansion. You know, the NFL used to be 10 teams with 15 players per team, everybody playing two ways. 
And so if you're putting in like five Hall of Famers a year from that era, there's only, you know, that represents a much higher percentage of all active players than when you're looking at 32 teams, 53 man rosters, plus practice squads, um, you know, the more teams there are. It, and, and it gets to like, what should a Hall of Famer represent? Like, I don't think it should just blindly be the top 2% of all players where like if we double league size, that necessarily doubles the number of Hall of Famers. Um, if we doubled rosters from 50 players to 150 players, I don't know that that should result in any more Hall of Famers. You know, the guys who are 60th on a roster are not really influencing the Hall of Fame cutoff. Uh, so there has to be some sort of, it, it's not just a blind, like how many players are on the league, a certain percentage of them should be making the Hall of Fames. I do think it should scale more linearly with like the number of teams. Um, I think there's probably twice as many Hall of Famers in a 32 team league than there are in a 16 team league, just because you're playing twice as many games, you have twice as many rivalries, you're getting twice as many big moments. Um, so yeah, part of it is that I feel there's not even standards across positions. And part of it is I often feel that there's not even standards like within a position. Um, and wide receiver is always my big thing here. Like, I don't know that you can look at the players who are in the Hall of Fame and the players who are not in the Hall of Fame. And from those two lists come up with like a coherent set of standards that says like, this is what makes you a Hall of Famer. Yeah. You know, like maybe it's championships, but there's plenty of receivers with championships who aren't in. Maybe it's statistics, but there's plenty of receivers with statistics who aren't in. And similarly, there's plenty of receivers without the statistics who are in. Because uh, there's know, players Bowl, with game-changing ability who may have, right. who've had indelible moments, but not right. indelible production. Right, right. Um, you know, and like Lynn Swan, you say, well, Lynn Swan demonstrates that the Hall of Fame cares about famous moments. Um, and yet there's other receivers out there who also have, you know, famous moments who are not in um, or who, who've won a lot of championships who are not in. And, um, you know, you, it would drive me nuts. People would mention Julian Edelman. Is Julian Edelman a Hall of Famer? Because, like, look at all of his playoff numbers. And no, there's no... I mean, Edelman was a great wide receiver and he was a great asset to the New England Patriots, but no, no. If we're getting to the point where Adding Edelman to the Hall of Fame just further muddies the picture of what a Hall of Fame receiver looks like. And if Edelman's in, then is Welker in? And then once Welker's in, then it just... <laughs> I'm a big fan of, like, consistency. I, I want an institution that says, like, this is what I want to see from you. Um, and I just, at some positions, I feel like we don't get that. I don't know. I, I think it's impossible to do because at the end of the day, it's, like you said, it's the different standards and then you look at scenarios where like it, you, you the way there are people a lot of things about hall of fame players is that they don't define category they are beyond category on some level now the, it doesn't mean we shouldn't attempt to do the job and i think that that's what is always going to make this a contentious thing and then it comes down to something that maybe i'm going to take a little off track but it it rose to mind as I'm listening to you talk about this is that, you know, at the end of the day, you, I, one of the things that used to, that kind of bugs me, but I can't say it's something I would get rid of because is the way we lionize players in the induction ceremony, you know, because I mean, LT, you know, Lawrence Taylor had his flaws, has his flaws certainly has issues that you may not like him as a person um brett Favre, you may not like as a person but you know there's a level of teams you know there's the desire to celebrate their careers and i think they do a pretty good job of having players celebrate their career and stay mostly on script to that and maybe talk a little family and if they want to go on and talk about their flaws they there's guys who've handled that pretty well on the whole there's some that haven't but mo most time i think they do but it there's part of me that want to go well maybe we shouldn't make as much of a big deal about this as we do but then it's like you're telling an institution that's trying to draw people to it and has to make money not to market its product so it's kind of ridiculous to to even go down that road but there's a part of me that kind of feels like it, you know it's 
it's a tough thing because you have to it, there's a lot of good teaching moments with like if you have a kid who's a football fan there's a lot of great teaching moments with this as they get older you, you know you know you're not going to tell your seven-year-old who may be you know 10 years ago loved brett Favre, you, you know and say you know well Favre's not really a, a good person and then go into and having an adult conversation with them but as they get older and we talk you know you get older and you have these things you can have these conversations and and talk about well you know the hall of fame is a nice honor it doesn't mean that this is your life's goal this shouldn't be your life's goal awards shouldn't be your life's goal the reward is you know the journey of what you're doing you know and i think that you know there's something about that that maybe we can do a better job of with that perspective and using that as a perspective builder as opposed to blowing everything out of proportion and some of this gets to consistency too yeah. um where officially for the hall of fame the guidelines for voters is that off the field incidents don't matter um and they don't unless they do and there's clearly cases where the voters have said like we're just going to ignore any off the field insinuations and there's also clearly cases where they have not i mean why was randy moss or terrell owens not a first ballot hall of fame receiver and that joe again, buck <laughs> right exactly like it wasn't you know. because of on yeah. the field it yeah. certainly wasn't um you know i think the most complicated hall of fame case uh is a guy named jim tyre who played um in the afl back in the 60s uh and he was like a perennial all pro i think he made like eight first team all pro lists um was like everybody who watched him was like this guy's a surefire hall of famer so he was five time first team all pro a bunch of second team all pros and six time first team all pro um everybody watched him thought this guy's surefire hall of famer he was part of the chiefs dynasty through the afl and into the nfl um no brainer lock after he retired um he kind of had a rough go of it i think he tried like being a traveling salesman it did not go well um eventually he uh wound up murdering his wife and committing suicide mm. uh with like his kids in the house incredibly horrific tale uh yeah. and so his first year of hall of fame eligibility he was brought up for discussion he was a finalist and we don't know what happens in discussion behind closed doors but then he never even made semi-finalist after that so i'm assuming what happened is he came up for eligibility and everybody said look we're told to ignore off the field incidents but we're not really putting jim tire in the hall of fame are we and everybody said no of course not um i say he's a complicated evaluation because there are multiple people in the hall of fame right now who have been credibly accused of murder like we're not as confident that they have killed someone but uh oj simpson is yeah. still in the hall of fame yeah marvin harrison uh not many people know about it because it happened after his playing career but he's credibly accused of either you know killing somebody or being involved in the killing of yep. somebody um and again i'm not saying he definitely did it because we don't like for jim tire we absolutely 100 percent sure know that he did it yes That's absolute confidence and these are allegations of varying strength ray lewis we don't know what happened in 2000 when he was in baltimore but we do know that he was credibly accused of at least obstructing the investigation of a murder with yep. potential that there's more beyond that um and again i'm not making claims as to what ray lewis's involvement was i'm not saying anything i'm just saying that Jim was brown part... and spousal abuse or domestic abuse serial serial domestic abuse and i love jim uh, brown right? as, a, as a player yeah yeah there are people in the hall of fame who hang on you hear me i better let's see give it one more shot here sorry hey sorry about that okay can you hear me yep better we're yeah. good there are people there are people in the hall of fame who like we know are not good people of varying degrees of not good people um, and I'm not saying that, like, we should completely ignore everything. I, I, I think it's a bad idea to ignore the field. Obviously, it's a sliding scale. Like, maybe somebody's comfort level is, I, 
I'm comfortable putting in somebody who's been credibly accused of murder. I'm not comfortable putting in somebody who definitely committed murder. Um, and I think it's also complicated by what we have learned about CTE over the last 20 years. Because um, Tyra was an offensive lineman, yeah. and we've learned that offensive linemen really take the brunt of it, not because of any like major single hits, but just the cumulative impact of a decade of slamming your head into the guy across the field. And remember, Tyra's playing in the era of the head slap. Um, so I'm pretty confident that Tyra took some substantial brain damage. Uh, my wife actually works, she does um, occupational therapist rehabilitation with people who've suffered pretty severe brain damage. And so I can tell you um, that it dramatically changes a person and, and their personality. And there's been case studies of, um, there was a guy who uh, brain tumor and after he got the brain tumor, he kept trying to like sexually abuse his daughter. And then they removed the brain tumor and like that completely stopped and he was horrified at the idea. And that brain tumor like caused and created that that change in his personality. And so I, I, I'm not even saying Tyre should be in. I'm just saying that it I is, think it is complicated. If you grew up in the right. if you grew up in the nineteen seventies, O. J. Simpson was the Michael Jordan of sports at that time. He he was on every commercial, he was on television. He was an unbelievable running back. Every kid wanted to be O.J. Simpson if you played football. That was just, I mean, that's how it was. I grew up watching him in wonder, absolute awe and wonder. He was an amazing running back at the peak of his career. I remember, the, I remember going to a Broncos game in the preseason with my dad who lived in Denver, and the only thing I was excited about, I didn't, care about the Broncos I was excited that OJ Simpson was playing for the 49ers and that he was gonna maybe maybe he would play in the preseason game he didn't because he was hurt and banged up and all that but I was I was watching OJ Simpson the entire time I didn't even care about the game I was watching him on the sideline just to see if he would get in the game you know so so as someone who's grown up and by the time I was 21, he's being charged for murder, you know, and, but the, but reading about him in the same breath as, you know, Gail Sayers and Jim Brown and, you know, Jim Taylor and all the great backs from that range of time is the same level as if you were reading about, you know, you can pick one of the players that I'm going to mention on this list of Adrian Peterson and LaDamian Tomlinson and, and Barry Sanders and Curtis Martin and Emmett Smith. And one of those turns out to be a murder, a murderer or a potential, or at least accused of murder. And you have real questions about whether or not he committed the crime or not. Those are, you know, when you go through that feeling, you know, you have one really strong association that's imprinted on you. And then you, you, you know, and see that now, I mean, I don't have much, you know, as someone who is, you know, you see that you have to just appreciate the complexities of life. And sometimes you just have to look at it and say, I can compartmentalize that OJ Simpson was a great running back. There's no denying that he was a great running back. That's a fact. There's also no denying that he had a very troubled life and that he may have caused, that he certainly caused pain of um, other people and families in his outside life, whether he committed the crime, that crime, or it was the other crimes that he did commit and got charged for, or that he served time for, or he was accused of, and you know, there's there's enough there that I mean, to me, I don't know. I mean, I just look at that, and I don't know if there's a, there's ever going to be a good answer for what to do there. And I'm okay with it, that there's not a good answer. The best answer is, is, you know, cause if somebody says, well, he shouldn't be in because what example does he set to children? I'm going to say, you set the example to your children. You right. do that. If you're good enough at that, certainly that's a hard lesson to teach. And they, you know, it's easy to say, oh, well you teach them. And then the kid looks at you and goes, but he was great. You say, well, they're not ready to understand that lesson fully yet, but you're going to keep finding ways to to be able to 
make that point clear and over time and if you teach the right things they're going to develop that perspective eventually your job is to to be your job isn't always to get them to think the way you want them to think sometimes your job is just to be the pushback on what they are thinking so that they are understanding that they are getting some level of pushback and someone that they've actually trusted through time and effort is actually pushing back at them and saying no that's probably not really the best logic there or i disagree with that logic and here's why because if they respect you and you teach them respect they're going to be able to look back at that and say yeah the old man wasn't as nuts as i thought he was that actually makes sense and I'm glad he actually continued to argue with me about that point, even though I may never admit it to him, at least for the next five or six years, because I'm, you know, I'm in my late 20s or my mid 20s, and I, I just can't do that just yet. But when I have kids, and I real, and I'm sitting there, and my kid says something ridiculous, you know, or I think is ridiculous, and I start doing that, I might start appreciating the perspective a little bit one day. Those are the types of things you do. You don't need. Right. You don't need the Hall of Fame to dictate morality for you. That's kind right. of my point with it. Yeah, I mean, the Hall is a physical institution. Obviously, yeah. it's in their best interest to make things simple and clean because yeah. complexity doesn't really sell. People no. don't really you, – you're not going to pay however much money to fly to Canton and go in and see the bust of O.J. Simpson and it describe, like, all of the credit – like, the credibility of the accusations. And, like, that's not – yeah. That's not what people are there for. And I get that. And, and that's again, why that's part of well, my... our podcast is free. <laughs> right. That's because <laughs> nobody would pay for it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's part of my dissolution with the, um, yeah, with the process. It's just, I think as somebody who, who doesn't have like that very extensive knowledge of history, the hall of fame is a great thing and it's a great way to learn and discover um, which really discovery is the hardest part of learning. It's not learning something. It's discovering what's there worth learning. And the hall is a great institution for that, despite what I would call its flaws. Um, but I don't know. I just feel like as I've gotten older, I've kind of moved past the point where the Hall of Fame, as it exists, is for me. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. I've, I've been to the Hall of Fame multiple times because I didn't live far from Canton, Ohio. And in my early years as a kid and I got to go back there maybe 15 years ago I think it was around 15 years ago uh, maybe a little longer than that um, and it's still a fantastic visit it's it, it because if you love football history and love the game there's such it's such a rich place for that you know that is the custodian of our of the history so it's it's absolutely worthwhile um and you know so that's enjoyable my dog would very much like to go which is probably why also our podcast is free hey dude what do we got going? we're in off season mode what do you expect yeah we're not in season mode and there's probably somebody doing something back there that i'm gonna have to tell him to leave in a minute let's see that or he saw deer i think he saw deer he, he he loves the he loves the deer. So we'll see if he continues barking. I'll pause this and get him out of the room. But I think no, no I think he's gonna go go out there himself. Yeah, go out there and go get whatever you saw, my man. All right. <laughs> but uh, let's get on to the nominees and see who we would take. Um, do you have do you have any ones that are like definite for you? But uh, and then we'll and we'll just go with the definites right now. Or do we uh, you know, go a different way? Hold on, let me pause this. I'll be right back. All right, now that we have Hugo bark in, in the background instead of like actually you know, in the actually microphone, in the microphone and on the room, you know, yeah. So who 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 do you have that you're like you're definitely sold on on making them the hall a hall of famer? Yeah, so important on the seniors list, Randy Gradisher. Uh, I think it has been the Hall's biggest embarrassment that it took them this long to put him in. Gratishar is one of the top four or five middle linebackers of all time. Uh, he was, um, you know, like everything you should want from a middle linebacker, he did it. He had the awards, um, the All-Pros, Defensive Player of the Year. 
He had the recognition of his peers. You know, he was a contemporary of Jack Lambert, who is, you know, considered, if not like the best middle linebacker, he's like a contender for best middle linebacker of all time. And if you watch contemporary broadcasts, anytime somebody talked about Lambert or Gratisher, they would say that Gratisher was on Lambert's level, that like, you know, they, there was an open debate as to who was the best middle linebacker in the league um, while they were contemporaries. And that debate just got forgotten. Uh, Gratishar, I think, was arguably the best short yardage run stuffer of all time because uh, of his timing and his instincts. And there's you could do a highlight reel of all the third and one, fourth and one stuffs, all of him going over top of um, the scrum to make tackles at the goal line. Uh, he was also fantastic in coverage. Um, he really had it all. Some would complain that his career was too short, uh, but he played 10 years, never missed a game in 10 years. Uh, and for middle linebackers, middle linebackers are the running backs of the defense. They have shorter careers. Patrick Willis, another guy on this list who I think is fully deserving of being on this list, um, is another guy who had a short career. Um, and that's just kind of the norm for the position. And I think Gratishar's exclusion kind of speaks to one of my complaints about the Hall of Fame is that it's a very political organization. Um, it's made up of people who have a point of view that like these people should be in. Um, not so much of you that these people should be out, but I think everybody has their guys that they want in. And there's a lot of horse trading where like, I'll help you get your guy in if you help me get my guy in. Um, and I think some cities were represented by people who were better at that process than others. Denver's representative for the long time um, was kind of famously uninterested in playing the game or making the effort. And um, as a result, Denver had a lot of very, very deserving candidates who never really got the consideration they should have um, because nobody was really pushing for them. Um, and there's a joke, you know, like among people who watch the Hall of Fame that like the guys who get in the senior committee are the guys whose supporters live the longest where, you know, like eventually there's only so many people left who saw these guys play and then their pet players tend to what's make the your, list. And... What's, your, uh, what's your take on getting media out of the equation to be the be um, judges for that and maybe keeping it to coaches and um, or, or some other group of people to do it? Because, I mean, there's some value to media being historians to some extent. But there's a lot of media that I look at, and I'm not going to name any names, but I just look at them and I go, you talk well, you're a bullshitter just like a lot of everybody else with this, and your opinion means no more to me than somebody at a bar. I think the best Hall of Fame voters have been members of the media. Okay. Um, but I don't think all members of the media are good Hall of Fame voters. I mean, I think... The guy probably who I admire most for his knowledge and, and dedication to history was Dr. Z at Sports <laughs> Illustrated. Yeah, yeah, I saw you. You were drawing the Z in the air. You knew exactly. Yeah. And and he was, I mean, obviously, like, he was not unbiased. He had his favorite players. Um, but I think he was independent. He was arriving at his favorite players independently because of who he liked. Um, and I'm not saying we should put everybody Dr. Z liked into the Hall of Fame. Um, but if we had 32 guys like Dr. Z, I think we would have the best possible version of the Hall of Fame. I think it would be perfect, amazing. I would have no qualms with it whatsoever. I would trust him implicitly. Yeah, and I Sports think, Illustrated. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Because like you were going to say, SI was the gold standard of journalism at that time. And I would argue that his pulpit at SI at that time allowed SI was wanting to have someone who had that kind of I would argue football guys like specialty knowledge at a certain area and celebrate that and allow him to be that whereas I feel like now we have a lot of beat reporters and maybe names and faces where it's more front-facing media who are more about creating conversation than, than as there's much about creating conversation as they are about actually being repositories of history and the game and analysis. And I think that that's why I would rather it be, is it more, I never really asked, but is it all media or is it a combination of media players and coaches and 
what it, people beyond category of just writers. So I forget the exact distribution. I know that each city gets its own representative, and then there's a few national representatives. Dr. Z was one of the national ones. Um, I think it's, I don't think, like, I don't think, like, they dedicate a certain number of votes to players or former players or former coaches, but I do think, like, a player or coach would be able to get one of these votes if they, you know, if they manage to get it. Um, you know, I think Sports Illustrated is kind of illustrative of the issue with the Hall of Fame. It had two votes for the Hall of Fame. It gave one of them to Dr. Z, who I think is uh, beyond reproach. Like, it, he is yeah. a historian's historian. Nobody had any problems with Dr. Z. And it gave the other one to Peter King, who um, I like Peter King. He's a very entertaining writer. Uh, he did not have the baseline historical knowledge, uh, which I don't think is a problem because he was very upfront that he didn't have that knowledge. And if you're curious and you're willing to investigate, I think you can start with a point where I don't have an opinion and I don't know, and you can research and you can form an opinion. And I think there are a lot of people who can and do do that very well. Um, but I just don't think either because he was busy or whatever that he really, he didn't do it in a way that satisfied me with, sure. with the outcome. And, and maybe that's just sour grapes where he preferred different guys than I prefer. But I remember he wrote a column in like 2010 or something about how like, oh yeah, I would nominate Darren Sharper for the Hall of Fame today, which for those who don't remember, Darian Sharper is a convicted serial rapist yeah. raped like a whole string of like 20 women across a string of tape uh, states this was known at the time he was in prison for it at the time and peter king is like oh well the hall of fame says ignore the off field stuff um so yeah sure i i think we should nominate him i think we should discuss him and and the issue is less like that he's saying that because i think that's a discussion worth having but he's saying it for darren sharper yeah because darren sharper ranks in the top five on the modern list in interceptions um, like, if you want to have that discussion, which uh, is a discussion very much worth having, have it for Jim Tyrer. You know, there's there's much better examples that we can use here, and he just doesn't have the, I don't think, the historical baseline That's, to understand. Yeah. And I don't think he has the context where, like, he reads the bylaws that say don't consider off-field stuff, but clearly they are considering off-field stuff. And I don't know. I... I've kind of stepped away from following the Hall of Fame so closely just because I'm always frustrated that, like, the voters are not me. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, you, you pick Gratishar. Who else, who else is on your absolute, like, I'm, I'm good, let them in out of the five if we could up to five? Let's see. Uh, I think that Devin Hester should absolutely be a Hall of Famer, but I don't think special teamers should get in on the same path as, as, um, positional players. Uh, I think there should be a separate path, sort of like it used to be that coaches and players were competing for the same spots. And that's just hard to say, like, Bill Parcells was a great coach, um, but, like, Lawrence Taylor was putting his body on the line sure. and Bill, in a way that Bill Parcells wasn't. And I don't think it's fair for someone like Bill Parcells to take a spot from someone like Lawrence Taylor. You know, okay. I think Don Coryell was absolutely deserving of a Hall of Fame position based on his contributions to the game, but I don't want that to come at the expense of a Randy Moss. Uh, so I think there should be a separate path for special teams players. If we were to put special teams players in, um, I would much rather see an interesting returner over a punter or a place kicker. Um, I think just the gap between good and elite at return specialist and especially guys who are able to sustain it for multiple years is is bigger than it is um at like the kicking positions i'm glad you um, said that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and they're also more intangibly like they're a lot more exciting they're a lot more interesting um you don't watch like justin tucker is the best to ever kick um but you don't watch ravens games to see justin tucker Whereas you absolutely tuned into the 2006 Chicago Bears to see what Devin Hester was going to do. Um, so I would make a separate path for returners. Hester would be my, or for special teamers, Hester would be my first pick there. Um, I'd also put in, if we're going to do returners, maybe like Rick Upchurch, uh, Mel sure. Gray. Um, Cordell Patterson's a hard one because he's the best kickoff returner of all time. But he also played in an era where the league is doing everything it possibly can to murder kickoff returns. Yeah. I think if he played 20 years before, 
he would have been viewed on par with Devin Hester. He just hasn't had as many opportunities to impact the game. Sure. Um, so I love Hester. I would, for me personally, remove him from this list just because I think special teamers should have a separate path. And also, if special teamers had a separate path, I would not get so frustrated at the fixation on Steve Tasker. Because, um, okay, I don't know if Steve Tasker is the best, you know, gunner slash coverage special teamer of all time. Maybe he is. Whenever anybody says, oh, this guy was the best of all time, I say, okay, who's the rest of your top five? So unless you can give me the rest of your top five, I'm not putting too much weight on you saying Tasker is the best. So, but, so I think you've made a great point about Steve Tasker, and I and to much to Bill's players' chagrin, um, I would add Alan Rossum was pretty good, but I can at least yep. pick one. But um, right off the bat, that I remember. But um, but I will say I will also say Brian Mitchell was also very good, but he also was a return specialist. Um, but if I were to I will say this, Devin Hester, I, I'm going to make a counter argument for Devin Hester. To me, I'll put him up, I, I'll take him right now, put him in right now. And the reason that is, is that I like the arguments you make about the excitement factor. I also respect the argument you're making about doing um separate track for special teams, but I would se separate that track. I would just separate kickers and punters because there's to a, anyone who played the game they all will tell you you have to be crazy to play on special teams at a high level especially returning punts and kickoffs because of the rate of injuries that happen in those plays themselves and how dangerous they are and how game-changing those single plays can be so for me while Devin Hester maybe didn't put his body on the line for as a high volume of plays as maybe say, you know, maybe Lawrence Taylor worked in a factory. Devin Hester was skydiving, you know, and I would, I would argue that the, that it's the gravity of the play that sometimes you look at and say the gravity of the plays that he had to be involved with in terms of potential for injury, mass chaos, and you know and what's inherent with that i i would i am i don't care i'm putting him in <laughs> yeah and if i couldn't get my separate track like i would hester is a hall of famer for me whether i can get my separate track yeah. or not yeah. um and also like it shouldn't be ignored that he also played as a position player you know he yeah. wasn't like the most phenomenal receiver or cornerback but he played up church again um played he was a solid wide receiver in addition to all of his his returning cribs um yeah for me typically when i'm thinking of like what makes someone a hall of famer outside of the intangibles which i think matter um and and the moments and everything which i think matter for me it's how much value did this guy add to his teams over the course of his career yeah. and hester just wasn't on the field enough to me, where if I'm doing the raw calculus, where like how much value did he add? Tremendous value per play, but he had, you know, like what, 200, 300 returns in his career? Um, For me, that's a uh, lot. For me, that's a lot. Yeah. yeah, no, he did. He did. He had a lot of returns. And, and as I said, Hester is really the only special teamer where if you're not willing to give me my special track, yes, Hester should be in. Um, I don't know if I look at this list, I'm not sure if he makes the top five for me because there's a lot of um, guys on this list that I like, but I completely agree. Special track, no special track. So, he should be in. Yeah. So who's your, who's your top five? If you're going to pick five. Um, Patrick Willis should absolutely be in, um, especially the hall of fame is saying that short careers aren't as much of an issue. I mentioned before middle linebacker is, I think the career is the position um, alongside running back where a short career is most forgivable um, just because the wear and tear at the position. Um, and Willis, to me, was the best linebacker in football for a number of years, um, super high peaks. I tend to, aesthetically, I tend to prefer guys with really high peaks. When I, when you're asking like how much value did a guy add, you can say how much did he add over a replacement player? Like how much value did he add if you got a guy off the street to fill this position or you can say how much value did he add over an average player at his position um, and a replacement baseline will favor guys with longer careers an average baseline will favor guys with higher peaks um, 
for Hall of Fame, I tend to compare it to like the league average. Like how much better than league average over his career and how long did he do it? And so for me, Patrick Willis easily clears that bar. Um, Antonio Gates um, for me is a no brainer Hall of Famer. Um, and I, both as a player and I think he impacted, he was part of the evolution in how we saw the position. Um, and he really was like the linchpin on a lot of phenomenal teams. I would put him in. Uh, Jared Allen, for me, is another no-brainer. Uh, so that's Gates, Allen, Julius Peppers, for me, is another no-brainer. Um, I think there's there was a lot of discussion with Allen, Peppers, and DeMarcus Ware. They have very, very similar careers in terms of games played, sacks, postseason awards. And there was a debate, like, which of these three would you pick? And I'm like, give me all three. Like, all three to me, I will say, I think the Hall of Fame is a little bit overly fixated on sacks and pass rushers versus off-ball linebackers, coverage linebackers, that sort of thing. But with that said, these to me were the three most feared, most disruptive, most dangerous pass rushers of their generation. Um, and all three to me pretty comfortably clear that bar. Um, Freeney, I'm not as high on. Um, and getting into the comparison game, you know, what's the difference between Dwight Freeney, Robert Mathis, and someone like John Abraham, who's not really getting any love um, by the Hall of Fame? I would probably pick Freeney first of those three, partly because of peak. I feel like he had a two or three year span where he was absolutely like, you were going into games as an offense saying like, how the hell are we going to deal with Dwight Freeney? In a way that I don't think you necessarily did with Mathis and Abraham at their peaks. Um, and and Indianapolis was building around Freeney. Like their whole identity was Peyton Manning's going to get a lead and Dwight Freeney is going to pin his ears back when they're forced into pass first mode. Um, but to me, Freeney was not quite at the level of a player as Ware, Peppers, or Allen, who I think were more complete um, all around players. And also, I think probably better purely as pass rushers. Okay. Um, I don't know. Do you agree with any of that? I'll look at the list and try to come up with yeah. a fifth while you. No. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I like the ones that you mentioned. Um, for me, uh, listen, Patrick Wills Willis, one of the best linebacker, middle linebackers of all time. Just easy, easy first ballot Hall of Famer. If he's a first ballot guy, he should be. Um, and I agree with you about the peaks. Um, did he change the game as a linebacker? Absolutely not. But he did. He played to the standard of what is expected of that position at the highest level for a sustained period of time, and and that's you know it's different playing at a high level over a long period of time. That's still worthwhile, but at the highest level for a sustained period of time, to me, it outweighs that. So I'm totally in on him. Antonio Gates, that's a no-brainer, too. I totally agree with that. He changed the game. Um, he and Tony Gonzalez really were, you know. And when you say change the game, I mean, listen. Kellen, people will say Kellen Winslow and Ozzie Newsome were guys that maybe arguably changed the game, you know, at a certain level. But I would say that Antonio Gates actually could was kind of a blocker and top receiver as well. I mean, he wasn't a great, great blocker, but he was a little more competent than those two other guys, I think, as a blocker. Um, and certainly he was, you know, he had a sustained, he had sustained excellence um, and then also had a high level of play even that was sustained after that excellence somewhat faded, you know. So even at the end of his career, he was he was very strong so i'm totally in on those two guys um let me look at the list again because i just let's see i would say too i don't know that gates changed the game so much as he was on the leading edge of a major schematic shift yes um because we've had receiving tight ends in the past we've had tight ends who were used and then the league had gotten away from that yeah. and then i think sharp gonzalez and gates kind of pushed the league back in that direction with the success that they were able to have. Yeah, I would say that another guy that, you know, out of those, so we've got those, we've got 
I'm Hester for me. I'm putting in just because I'm a believer. Okay. I love the special teams element of that. I think that it's. I've already made that argument, but I feel like that teams feared kicking. Teams there were teams that probably went for it and failed because they didn't want to kick it to Devin Hester. There were there were moments like that with him. So you know my th first my three certainly Willis Hester and um, and Gates. Um, after that, I'm going to argue Eric Allen. And I'm totally okay with that. I'm yeah, very open to that argument. Yeah, because yeah, Eric Allen, here's the thing. You play 14 years at cornerback in the league. Um, where they, Which the, is not a position known for its year-to-year -year consistency either. Not at all. You know, you, you know, you were in six Pro Bowls you know, which isn't bad, you know, it just says that that was a strong level of play. You played well, really for three different teams, you know, at, at three different systems. Um, you were in a scheme where you could also, where, you know, it emphasized a little bit more of the ability to press and be physical. So maybe you could say, well, is that of an advantage for a cornerback or not? I don't know. I look at it as, you certainly had to defend the run better as a cornerback probably in earlier days than you do now. I would say you have to be able to tackle. You have to be more of a complete player, I think, than you did, do now. Um, so Eric Allen, to me, certainly, I, I like him on that list. I'm going to, you know, I, I certainly respect the other op options there, but I've got what? I've got my first four. And then I'll say my fifth. I, you know, I'm going to be a total offensive homer with this, but I'm going to say Andre Johnson, just because. I was going to ask which of the three receivers you would take of that trio. I, I love Torrey Holt, but Torrey Holt and Torrey Holt will be in the Hall of Fame. I think he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame for the way the Hall of Fame is built. Um, he was an excellent route runner. He was also fantastic for the system. So if I'm looking at ability, if I'm looking at ability and sustained excellence, because Horry Holt has sustained excellence and his ability was his route running. Reggie Wayne, same thing, was his route, mostly his route running. Um, Andre Johnson was his route running, his physicality, his ability to make contested catches. He could do everything everything and he had the shittiest quarterbacks of the of the three for the most sustained period of time i mean does he have he had you could say matt schaub was an above average quarterback maybe for certain periods of 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 time while they were together but andre johnson put it together with you know he might as well have been playing with the cleveland browns quarterbacks um in recent years you, you know and doing and I'd add too, I think Andre Johnson meant more to his franchise on and off the field. I think he continues to mean more to his franchise on and off the field. I think if you know if Indianapolis hired a new head coach today and Reggie Wayne came out and said, "Oh yeah, I think this is a great hire," Indy fans would be like, "Oh cool." You know, if if the Rams hired a head coach and Torrey Holt came out and said, "I think this is a great hire," Rams fans would be like, "Cool." You know, Torrey Holt, we like Torrey Holt. If the Texans hire a head coach and Andre Johnson comes out and says, I think this is a great hire. Texans are a hundred percent sold. Like Andre's word is, and I think quite deservedly, I think he's earned this level of buy-in and trust from his fans. But like Andre's word is sacrosanct. Like, Oh, he's got Andre's blessing of approval. We're fully on board. Yeah. And that franchise needed a star. Um, and he was the first star. Yeah. Um, and he, for much of his career, the only real star, uh, and I think that matters and should matter for Hall of Fame considerations. Yeah, and when you think about him, what's funny is one of the most famous moments in his career was him beating the shit out of Cortland, Cortland Finnegan and losing it. And it was one of those scenarios where, you know, the team gave him a game ball. Now, you can look at that and say, there's something wrong with that. But if you look at the nuance of it, there was actually a little bit more to it than that because Cortland Finnegan was probably the league's goon at the 
cornerback position for years. And I, lo- I was a Titans fan at that time, and I loved Cortland Finnegan as an instigator, but I knew if I were the opponent or the fan of the opposing team, I would hate Cortland Finnegan's guts. And when he got his ass kicked, or somewhat kicked in that game, I mean, I was a Titans fan still, and I was laughing. And I was like, good for Andre Johnson. But it was like, Andre Johnson, to, the reason he got rewarded wasn't because he beat the shit out of Cortland Finnegan. It was because, really, for all the years that Andre Johnson has comported himself with class for years and years and years, it was it was really that singular moment to say, I'm standing up for our team. And, yep. and you may not see it that way as a fan with your little kid and going, oh, there's that thing. But I look at it this way is like, I mean, I wrote an article about this long time ago where, you know, my, one, of my, one of my daughters in first grade asked the classic question, what happens if a kid's picking on me? And then they keep asking you the follow-up questions when you say, go tell the teacher. We'll get away from them. And when you have time, go tell the teacher. Well, no, if the teacher's not there, we'll try and get away with them and hang with your friends. Oh, well, you, you can't do anything about it? Okay, well, if you do this, if you, I'm, this is, I need you to do if exactly what I'm telling you. If you've exhausted all other options. Exhausted right. all other options. This is what I want you to do. And I want to make sure that you know that if I find out you just did this because you're in trouble. If you didn't do this, if you did this for the reasons I said, you're not in trouble with me. Even if you get in trouble with school and I will support you and argue your point in school. And she, I remember she's looking at me, you know, and I'm going, you hit and kick that kid until they are on the ground. And they are not that they're not moving and not breathing, but they're not, they're not able to get up right away. And then you go run and tell somebody, you know, but yes. And them looking at me in shock and I'm thinking well in the next two weeks I'm about to have some conversations with my you know with the mother of my child and and the school two weeks go by nothing five years go by nothing six years later she's in a classroom and a boy's picking on her and the classroom was empty where the teacher was gone because they had to handle a drug issue in the hallway of the middle school um and she went out there, the teacher had sent her back in and the boy kept picking on her and she kicked his ass. And and they had to pull her off of him. And so, you know, the teacher, they were gonna suspend her, you know? And I said, I told the teacher this, what I said. And I said, ask me how many fights she's been in since I told her that. And the teacher laughed and I said, can you go ask the, the or the, ask the principal? And I said, go ask the teacher if she went out there as she told me, because if she's telling the truth, she went out there and asked and she came back and she goes, instead of suspending her for a week, we're suspending her for one day because fighting is wrong and just kind of laughed and we both laughed. And I took my daughter out for pizza and I just asked, I'm like, so I just wanted to see, was she ambivalent about the whole thing? You know, and her ambivalence was, yeah, she was like, on the, she was like, well, he was my friend until he did that. and. And so I was kind of felt bad that I had to do that. And she said, but I felt kind of good that I stood up for myself. And she said, and then I kind of felt, she didn't say it this way because she was 11 years old, but she's like, I felt kind of sheepishly good when all the troublemakers sitting outside the principal's office were telling, laughing and telling them, telling each other not to mess with me, Um, you know? And I was just like, she felt ambivalence and that's all I wanted her to feel was the complicated ambivalence of like, I can defend myself, but this is, but this is wrong. And I think that you look at someone like, and I looked at that as like Andre Johnson, who's who carried himself with class in the league, who, but at the same time knew what being a leader was. And sometimes you have to be a leader and say, this is wrong. And I'm willing to do something. Maybe that's by the rules wrong to enforce what needs to happen here and get my team going. And he was that he was that player who led by example. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if, if he had had a history of a short fuse or, you know, like some receivers play angry, if it was Steve Smith, I don't think we, we give him <laughs> right. the benefit of the doubt. I don't think no. he deserves the benefit of the doubt. No. That's just Steve Smith being an asshole. I love him. Steve Me Smith too. is an asshole. Yeah. That was his game. Yes. That was not Andre Johnson's game. He was big. He was physical, but he wasn't 
He was like Tim Duncan. He, he, he was Tim Duncan right. of the NFL. Like right. Tim Duncan wasn't bothered by anything. He just like right. laughed it off and looked at you and and wouldn't get you couldn't get under his skin. So if Tim Duncan kicked your ass in the in you the NBA, it it, yes, you'd have it coming by right. a mile. <laughs> right. He was Tim right. Duncan. Yeah. Yeah, and it's again you talk about how much players mean to the franchise. Like, look at how Houston fans still lionize that, and they joke that, like, the first statue in front of uh, the stadium should be Andre Johnson beating up Cortland Finnegan. And they need to uh, invite Cortland Finnegan when it happens. That Right. That would be awesome. And it was, you know, like, I think the team needed it. I think the fan base needed it. Um, because that was a team where, at times, it seemed like maybe it didn't care. And it, yeah. it needed somebody to care. And Andre Johnson cared. Uh, so for me, of the receiver options, he's the clear number one. Um, I, with you, I think Holt probably should be in eventually, although I, thoughts are complicated on, at receiver because I feel like that's one where there's already a big haul. I'm hesitant to advocate for more receivers getting in, but Holt, I think, meets the bar. Wayne, I would not put in. I get the numbers, I get the whatever, but to me, he wasn't like the game wrecker. Yeah. Like some of these other guys were. I agree. He's a he he was a great complimentary player who benefited greatly from from really two Hall of Famers who helped him get matchups. And not that he wasn't a capable player with the matchups that he had and even against really good players, but he wasn't Hall of Fame level, I don't think, on that. So yeah. Well it's like the Brock Purdy discussion, like People will say, oh, it's all system, it's all scheme, whatever. You have to be really good to take advantage of that yeah. scheme and that system. But also, inarguably, there are tailwinds here helping yeah. him. Yeah, can he transcend it? And right. what we know for sure is Andre Johnson transcended it, and there are other wide receivers who will come along. And Steve Smith transcended system. He may have been an asshole, like you said, because that was his game to be an asshole. And he would be the first to admit that and has you know essentially but yeah he's a he's a transcendent player because of what he could do so is it but would you are you taking andre johnson over any of the other options for your fifth maybe as my fifth yeah as i look at it he might be my fifth here um willie anderson i think there was this weird like campaign for willie anderson where they're like oh he didn't allow a sack in like an eight-year span and um i follow somebody uh, named Pierce Convoy on Twitter, and he's like, uh, yeah, here is like a highlight reel of all the sacks that Willie Anderson did not allow during that eight-year span. <laughs> and, <laughs> so it gets, uh, you know, like, the campaign got out over its skis. I don't think you need to, like, exaggerate his case to make his case, and it does leave kind of a bad taste in my mouth that I feel like a lot of the momentum behind him was based on a misrepresentation um but despite that if that was what needed to get him some traction then so be it because he is also um worthy uh i would i would hope he makes it in eventually i don't know if he makes my top five here and that's the problem with the class is not expanding is it's not going to be any easier to make the top five next year it's not going to be any easier to make it after that um yeah so yeah, I, it, it becomes a numbers game, and and there's a lot of like, oh well, you, the guy you think deserves to be in didn't make it this year. Well, he'll get in eventually, and it, you can't—they can't all make it in eventually. Eventually, time's going to run out, and some of these people are going to be left out in the cold. Um, um, can, um, can, can, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say this: if there's a player on this list that I think is an absolute first ballot Hall of Fame talent, but didn't have a Hall of Fame career, it's Fred Taylor. That's what I was going to say. Can we both agree that we love Fred Taylor and yeah. also that Fred Taylor has no business being on the list? No, we we can absolutely agree with that. And it's heartbreaking in a way because that's sure. the that's the angsty part of it because at his best, Fred Taylor Fred Taylor's highlights stack up with any running back you will ever watch. Period. That's I I, I don't care. Like, I mean the the ability to cut at his speed the 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 suddenness the strength the contact balance the pass catching ability there if you were to say what does a hall of famer look like on the field that's fred taylor 
you you would you would say <coughs> that. So if you're gonna do Hall of Fame based on talent, you would put him in. But you'd also put Josh Gordon in if you ask me. Um, so that's why you don't do the Hall of Fame that way. And we can talk about the Pro Bowl, but he made one Pro Bowl. Like that's his resume. He was he was a second team All Pro, made one Pro Bowl in one season. wasn't his best season. Um, I think it was kind of uh, people were realizing that Fred Taylor has never made a Pro Bowl in his career, and like that shouldn't stand. We should do something about that. Sort you of. You have to be available yeah. to make the Pro Bowl. Right, and and he had some good years that just happened to coincide with other people also having good years. Um, I think the whole fragile Freddie thing was super unfair, and it was just yeah. a misunderstanding of the nature of injuries at the position. And yeah. he he really didn't miss nearly as much as people think he did, but. The reality is I could name five running backs off the top of my head who are not a finalist here, who I would put in the Hall of Fame over Fred Taylor, um, Tiki Barber, Marshawn Lynch, uh, Ricky Waters. Um, you know, it's it's just, again, it, it gets to, I love Taylor. I loved watching him play. Uh, that Fred Taylor, Maurice Jones drew Jacksonville backfield was maybe my favorite backfield of all time just Great in terms of like the stylistic difference and how fun players. it was and and how much they like everybody clearly loved each other like that was just an easy backfield to root for well that they um, honestly name a name name i don't think you can name five running backs in the NFL today who are better than either of those running backs i would i would agree you, for sure I, I mean maybe you could put McCaffrey up there Maybe you could yes, put. Yes, for sure he was. Yeah. You could put Chubb up there. Um, I don't know if you can. Maybe you could argue Derrick Henry to a degree, but I don't think so. I think, I think. Are we talking guys, like right now, or are we talking like right now? Best versus best, right like, now. Yeah, okay. right now. And best versus best in terms of best backfields overall, there are some names you could put. But like I'm thinking, just like to, by today's standard. Maurice Jones Drew would wipe the floor with almost every running back in the league right now, especially with the way the rules and the offenses are set up. Oh my God, he'd make, I don't know if he'd make Christian McCaffrey, he wouldn't make Christian McCaffrey look like trash. He would be on par with Christian McCaffrey. Right. At his Very best. similar. I think comparable, I think comparable style and production too. I, I always said Maurice Jones Drew is what everybody thought Reggie Bush was. Yes. But with more power. Yes. With a lot more power, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and so the fact that those two split time, it's like, I laugh because when I think of like, I see those two split in time and I think Dan Campbell's going somewhere going, that's what was in my mind <laughs> when I want to have two backs because I remember those guys on the field. But, I mean, though they were I would put, unbelievable. I would go as far as I would put Jones Drew in the Hall of Fame before Fred Taylor. I wouldn't put either. To me, they're, neither of them is really close. But if I were to pick one from that yeah. backfield, I would probably pick Jones Drew over Taylor. I would say, I'm, and I'm going to say this because I feel it needs to be said. I would put Fred Taylor and Maurice Jones Drew over a lot of the backs who are in the Hall of Fame right now based on ability if we were going to play sure. that game. But that just means that the other backs didn't belong in the Hall of Fame. And, and I loved those backs. Like, to me, that doesn't take anything. To, it takes very little away from their their skills and careers. Because if, if I saw, if if someone said to me, Fred Taylor, Maurice Jones, Drew, I would say two of the best backs I've ever seen. And it doesn't have to be Hall of Fame to say that. Right. And I don't, I don't even think it necessarily means the other guys don't belong in the Hall of Fame. I think Fred Taylor was a better running back than Curtis Martin. Um, but... I don't really have a problem with Martin being in the Hall of Fame, just in terms of just the consistency. He was year after year after year after year after year a top 10 running back. Um, and I think that, you know, there are backs I would take out of the Hall of Fame. Um, but I think there's some guys who are, maybe were not as good, but but it's it's a career recognition. It's not about how good you were. It's about what you did. Yeah, I'll just look. I just so that I can, we can end this on a fun note. I'll just put it this way: um, to, for all my Steelers fans out there, just so that I can rib you, and I don't really mean this, but you know, just for the hell of it, I I definitely put Fred Taylor and Reese Jones Drew over Franco Harris in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, without a in terms we of we can take in, Franco out. 
Well, <laughs> oh, in terms of ability, in terms of ability, I think they were better backs than Franco yeah. Harris. But again, it's about what you yeah. did, and I Franco agree. Harris. I'm just trying to rile up Steeler fans. What do you want okay. me to say? That's all. <laughs> okay. Well, if you want to rile up Steeler fans, tell them that there was a uh, wide receiver who was a better blocker than Heinz Ward. No, I can't do that because I'm a Georgia fan. So I, I okay, can't, I can't do that. But there, there probably was. I, who was who was your better blocker wide receiver than Heinz Ward? Oh, I don't know. I mean, that's what oh. I say. People always okay. say like Heinz Ward is the best blocking receiver yeah. of all time, and then my response is always, "Okay, give me the rest of your top five. Yeah, I don't have a top five list. I don't really have yeah. an opinion on who the best blocking receivers of all time are, but that's why I don't come out and say, say so definitively that Heinz Ward was the best. Yeah. That's for sure. I'd say he's one of the most physical wide receivers of all time. Sure, that's. I think he deserves his reputation, every bit of his yeah. reputation, as like a just a brutal blocker. He's yeah. probably on that top ten list, but he's. You know, yeah. if you don't have an opinion on all wide receiver blocking, I don't think your opinion on Heinz Ward's wide receiver blocking is necessarily all that informed. So, folks, do your do your homework, and we've got two assignments for you for those of you who write in, which is. Um, Five five players in Steve Tasker's you know Gunner group who were your top five you know for that whether he's in it or not which I would imagine he will be I'll give you a clue Alan Rossum is one of them um, and then and then yeah top five wide receiver blockers of all time and then I'll throw out since you mentioned Rossum Rossum is also the only player to return a kickoff for a touchdown on five different teams look at that I know he was with the Giants I think he was with the Eagles. I'm pretty sure he was with Washington, um, but I don't remember the other teams he was a part of. I th oh, the Ravens? I think he was late in his career with the Ravens. Am I right? Uh, no, you're wrong about most of those, actually. Oh, look at that. I don't remember shit. All right. <laughs> <Alan Ross. laughs> Falcons, Packers, Eagles, 49ers, uh, and the Steelers. Oh, the and he also had a cup of coffee Giants. in Dallas. He played one game on Dallas. Who was I um, thinking on the Giants? Because there's a Giants player who was really good. But I remember Rossum with the Eagles. I'm conflated two players. That was the problem. I got to remember who the third player is now. At least I'm on my way to three of the five. So remember that there was a tweet that went around um, a couple weeks ago where like it's about like guys – are too busy like naming obscure receivers yeah. and then, like everybody was quote tweeting it naming an obscure receiver yeah. like i think our listeners should do that but for uh special teams players from the 90s yeah i think that's a i good can start idea. us out michael bates for the panthers there you go that's a nice one that's a nice one for sure wow well i'd pick billy billy white shoes johnson but he's probably not obscure so he shouldn't be see obscure. i'm an i'm an upchurch over over white shoes guy i think white shoes had more sizzle and upchurch had more stake and he probably controlled oh, a little bit more on offense i would agree with that though i would say honestly white shoes was a better i think i would argue white shoes was a, was a more timely player on offense with things that he could do but he wasn't he probably wasn't as consistently used um which was sad but uh it is what it is but uh all right well this was fun you know i mean we had a good time i hopefully you guys had a good time too or you got righteously pissed off about, you know, who we picked for the Hall of Fame and we'll hear from you. Either way, you know, we enjoy that you listen and, you know, check out Adam's content that's available with the paywall down, the the FSWA finalist for Writer of the Year award nominated um, content that you can find there. Um, you can find me at the Rookie Scouting Portfolio in addition to football, guys. I'm a little off. I'm 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 off on sabbatical at football guys until you know later in the spring, but you know I'm working hard. It's really do you have something month. going on? I, are, I, are are you busy on something? Yeah, I'm busy on something. So you know <laughs> I'm putting together. I'm, it's RB month at the RSP cave. So I'm gonna continue my look at Audric Estime. Um, you know this morning and or, or now it's afternoon and we'll go from there and see if I can dodge my free safety or my strong safety dog and not get another injury. All right. Thanks folks. Bye.